The Apostle Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, we begin this morning by singing a hymn that reminds us of that great hope. Number 775, All my hope on God is founded, all my trust is he shall renew. Number 775.
Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord our God, we bow before your presence this morning together. And it is with gladness that we confess that all our hope in life and death is founded on you and is founded on you alone. Indeed, you alone are our hope. Even as all around us in this world might fail, will fail, indeed will crumble and fall into dust, human pride, earthly glory, how fragile, how fleeting these things are, the things that we fashion with such love, with care, with toil, and yet so quickly these things are removed, so swiftly, so suddenly, can all collapse as our very bruised leaders in both Westminster and in Holyrood know this weekend to their cost and to their humbling. But God's power, hour by hour, is our temple and is our tower of strength. And your great goodness does last forever. It shall never be thwarted. And how thankful we are, our God and Savior, to be your people, to walk in this sure light of yours all through this dark world. And how we need the assurance that your word gives us that this great hope is ours in Jesus Christ, your Son, because we live in this world and we are so often grieved, we are so often bruised, so often we're perplexed as we live in this world that is still so adrift and as we long for, as we need your coming, coming of our Lord Jesus to make all things new. And yet, Lord, day by day as we look to you, as we trust in you, you do give us so many gifts of your love, so many things to assure us as you lead us so steadily towards our true home. And as you remind us of that joy, that glory that is ours even now and will be overwhelmingly ours on the great day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray, Lord, this morning, help us. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on that great hope and on the grace that will be brought to us when our Lord Jesus returns. And so lead us, we pray, today and every day. Lead us in obedience to that Lord Jesus, our Savior, so that we shall never fall. And we ask this for the glory of your great name. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a warm welcome uh, this morning to all of you upstairs or downstairs. And uh, if you're visiting with us, if it's your first time here particularly, we welcome you warmly in the name of the Lord Jesus. We very much hope that you uh, feel at home with us here and sense that you are indeed among a congregation of the Lord's people. And uh, we hope that we'll have a chance to greet one another uh, at the end of the service. Can I draw your attention to these uh, sheets? I think you should have one on your seat. They have uh, various, uh, various notices about the uh, life of the church this coming week and uh, in the future. Uh, please do read them carefully and uh, use them during the week as you pray for the work in the church and uh, throughout the world. Let me uh, draw attention to just two or three things. First of all, in the middle, if you are a regular at the lunchtime Bible talks, please note there won't be one this week. We have the uh, Servants of the Word conference here Tuesday to Thursday. And um, so there'll be no service. But please do be praying for the conference and uh, for those who are speaking at it and taking part this week. We're delighted to have uh, one of the main speakers, Peter Adam, with us this morning to preach to us today. Uh, Peter was here at the conference and uh, preached to us two years ago at this time. We're delighted to welcome him back all the way from Melbourne, Australia. And uh, it's a great joy, Peter, to have you with us once again. Please be praying for Peter for 
Andy Gemmell, for Dick Lucas, and for various others taking part this week. And there will be a time of real encouragement to the various pastors and Christian workers uh, who will be gathering here for that uh, time, Tuesday to Thursday. Second, if you look on the right-hand side there, uh, Sunday the 11th of June, that is today, and uh, please do not come here at 6.30 this evening, and please do not go to the Queen's Park building at 4.30, because if you do, you'll be very lonely, none of us will be there. There's uh, a service this evening jointly at 6.30 in the Kelvin Grove building, and if you don't know where that is yet, or... uh, you need help to get there, please speak to me or somebody uh, after the service would like to to help you. It's a special joint evening service and we will be ordaining uh, Josh Johnson, who is uh, one of our ministry staff. Josh has been in training with us uh, for five years now and uh, it's going to be ordained this evening to the ministry of word and sacrament. So please do all come along and, uh, and join in for that. Please pray for Josh. He's been floored almost quite literally most of this week with a very bad back and uh, it's going to be quite a struggle for him this evening, so please do pray. Uh, He's, uh, I hope, lying in his bed, taking it easy uh, at the moment, but we do want him to be able to be there this evening, so please pray for Josh and uh, for this evening's service. Then finally, if you look below that, you'll see next week there is yet another race. We had the women's 10K last week, now we've got the men's 10K. This seems to be a new one, but um, it's going to be involving road closures in both the city center and the west end. So please do look that up on the internet. And uh, if you don't have the internet, speak to somebody who does and try and ascertain what the difficulties are going to be next Sunday and uh, make sure that you can get here. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices. Uh, As I said, do do that, please. But we're going to turn now to our Bible reading for this morning, which you'll find in the New Testament in Peter's first letter. If you have one of the blue visitor's Bibles, that's page 1014. If not, it's near the end of your New Testament, after Hebrews and James and before 2 Peter. And we're reading in chapter 1 and the first uh, half of the chapter, down to verse 13. So it was first Peter at chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, so that you may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
And may God bless to us this word. We're going to sing again the hymn on the screens that again points us to this great hope that burns within our hearts and gives us strength for every passing day. a few moments of quiet now as the musicians play and as our offerings for the Lord's work are received. You might like to pray quietly for those known to you to be in particular need at this time. Or perhaps you might like to meditate again on these words of scripture we'll be studying together shortly. But as we do that in a quiet, our offerings are received.
Let's pray together. Our Father, we bow before you, the Lord and King of this world and all worlds. And how thankful we are for the surety, the certainty that we have in knowing the truth that you have revealed to us of your kingdom, which shall never be shaken, and of your plan and purpose for this world and every nation within this world, every tribe and tongue and people, and every one of your own children, a purpose and plan which is immovable, cannot be changed, and will be seen to be by all this earth one day full of glory and joy and gladness and wonder. And so, Lord, in these days of great change and uncertainty, not only in our own nation but all around the world, we come to you in bringing our prayers and petitions as you command us to do with a great sense of peace and assurance despite all that may seem to be so unsettled around us. We think of the aftermath of the election this week, all the surprises, all the uncertainties that flow from it. The Prime Minister and indeed the First Minister here in Scotland, both humbled. And many questions remaining, many battles to be fought but many great things to be faced of huge moment and significance for our nation in the weeks and the months to come we pray Lord for the new government that is being formed for the Prime Minister and for the cabinet that will continue to lead for all those who will be returned to Parliament for the Queen's speech and for the term of Parliament that follows. And we pray, Lord, in the midst of this maelstrom of political change and uncertainty, we pray that you would give us parliamentarians and ministers who will seek the national good before their own party political point scoring, for senior leaders who will likewise seek to serve the common good rather than serve their own self-interest and seek to merely take advantage of circumstances to promote their own ambitions and aspirations for power. We pray, Lord, for the media, for the journalists, for the people whose lives so much seem to be lived around the Westminster bubble, who conceive of these events only as an opportunity for stark headlines and for tearing down rather than for building up. And we ask, Lord, that they too would be humbled and that all would see that in these days the great responsibility upon all who holds positions of such influence in public life, that responsibility is great and grave. We dare to ask, Lord, for a true humbling to come upon the people of this country. We should seek that which is good and true and right and wholesome, and that which will bring the stability and peace to this nation that you command us to pray for, even so that the church of Jesus Christ may be able to safely and openly and powerfully proclaim the gospel of your Son. Lord, we do note that there is such hostility, such antipathy to any in public life who would even dare to hold to a position that seems to smack of a Christian past that our nation seems so determined to erase and forget. So significant that all that we are hearing of the potential alliances in Parliament between the majority Conservative Party and the Democratic Unionist Party. So much of the criticism is based around the fact that many of those MPs dare 
to oppose abortion, to oppose the inexorable march <coughs> of policies which are aimed to undermine and destroy the foundation planks of our society and every society, that is, true marriage and stable family life. So, Lord, in the midst of all of this, we pray by your mysterious sovereign power beyond our understanding, you would and will be working to preserve our nation, to foster and to promote those who seek to enact policies that are good and healthy and true and which can prevent decay and demise in our society. We pray, Lord, for all who will be in power north and south of the border. And we ask that you would, in your mercy, grant us better government than we deserve. And have mercy upon us, we pray. To that end, Lord, we pray for your church in every place in these islands of ours. Wherever this morning people are gathered, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask, Lord, that the word of the true Jesus Christ would be heard. The commands of our Lord and Savior through your apostles, so often today watered down, jettisoned completely, opposed, even in the name of your Son. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. We ask for those who are church leaders in the public eye, who do have the opportunity to speak to the cameras and to the microphones. We pray that they would, as you command us to, that they would take every opportunity and make the most of it to speak a word of truth about the hope that is within us and to point people to the truth that is in Jesus Christ. How easy it is, Lord, for such leaders to seek the approval of this world, the approval of the chattering classes, the media, the politicians. Grant us, we pray, those who will be unbending in their commitment to truth and unflinching in the face of hostile fire. Help us to pray for them, to pray with them for strength, for clarity, for truth. We pray for denominations across this land, large and small, and every individual congregation, and ask, Lord, that you would draw them and their leaders back to the truth and the unchanging word of God. We think especially of the small band of leaders and churches in the Scottish Episcopal Church following the decision of that denomination this week to promote and to accept a further corruption of marriage as taught in your word. Help them and encourage them, we pray, Lord, to stand firm and to stand true. Give them wisdom in every action they seek to take to make that clear. And grant them, we pray, the strength of your Holy Spirit not to be swayed, not to be drawn away from the truth that alone leads to salvation. And so for all of us, Lord, every one of your people in this our land, grant us, we ask, your grace and your mercy. Grant us the strengthening of your Holy Spirit. Grant us eyes that are oriented to your coming kingdom and all its glory that we might live every day strongly filled with the resurrection hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, to that end, as we turn to these marvelous words of the Apostle Peter this morning, grant us, we pray, to read them, to hear them, to mark them, to inwardly digest them today and every day of this week, that we might live following you loving you more dearly and serving you more nearly for the sake of your great love for us. And we ask it in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. As Peter comes to preach to us then, let's sing together number 519, uh, which is a prayer for God to open our eyes. Come, Holy Spirit, sent from God the Father, friend and teacher, counselor and guide, 
our thoughts directing, keep us close to Jesus and in our hearts forevermore abide. Number 519. Well, it's a great delight to be with you this morning. Thank you so much, Willie, for your invitation to speak. My father's uh, family left Glasgow in 1852 to uh, go to sunny Australia, to Melbourne, and we've been there ever since, and we enjoy the sunshine. I look around, there might be some relatives here. If you look a bit like me, we might be relatives. Be warned. Now, God has given us, most, most of us, two ears. Uh, and the reason God has given us two ears that, is that we might listen to sermons for ourselves with one ear and listen to the sermon for somebody else with the other ear. Because I find that God speaks to me when I hear sermons, even when I preach them myself, miraculously enough. But also somebody will ask me a question the next week or two and I think, well, I heard a sermon about that recently. What did the preacher say? And it comes back to my mind and I think, thank you God for telling me that last Sunday so I can tell this person today. So let's pray that God will help us to hear for ourselves and also help us to hear for others. Let's pray. God, our gracious Heavenly Father, by the power of your Spirit, bring your words home to us for ourselves. And bring your words home to us for the sake of others for whom we pray and to whom we speak. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you listen to those words from 1 Peter. I'm going to be preaching from verse 3 to uh, eventually verse, verse 13. And verse 3 begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
according to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been born again by the work of God. Jesus tells us in John chapter 3 that we're born again to eternal life. Peter puts it slightly differently here in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says we are born again to a living hope. If you're not born again, you won't have a living hope. You'll either have black despair or dead delusions. And I hear dead delusions every time I go to a funeral. People say afterwards, well, you know, he's playing golf in the great golf course in the sky. I think that's wildly improbable myself. See, what people do is use science to disprove Christianity, but then believe the most ridiculous ideas. One I heard recently was, it was a death after the death of a fireman, well, he'll be busy in hell putting out fires for eternity. <laughs> well, I guess you couldn't say he'd be putting out fires in heaven. So they said he'd be putting out fires in hell. Well, it'll take a long time to do that, won't it? What a stupid idea. Putting out fires for eternity. <laughs> I can't believe it. For without being born again to a living hope, we are stuck with black despair or dead delusion. But we have been born again to a living hope. Peter says we're born again by God's great mercy, that is God's eternal character and his eternal decision to have mercy on us. He says we're born again by the resurrection of Christ from the dead, that is by God's special event in the created world in human history. So when God raised Jesus from the dead, he not only accepted his sacrifice, raised his son from the dead, and by promise raised every man, woman and child who will ever live to life again. But he also raised us to newness of life, raised us to a living hope. You've been born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Peter says, next verse 4, into an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Well, in the Old Testament, the inheritance meant the land, the promised land. That land today, which is not in the best of conditions, is it? But the promised land, the inheritance for believers in Jesus Christ, is not an earthly land, but a heavenly land. It is to be in God's place, in God's presence, with God's people forever. That is our inheritance. In God's place, in God's presence, with God's people forever. That is your living hope. That is our living hope. Imperishable, it will last forever. Unfiled, it will, undefiled, it will never decay. Unfading, it will never lose its splendor, its glory for all eternity. That is our living hope. Now, I come from a non-Christian family, and I was converted at the age of 16 at school. And I can remember after I was converted, I decided that I would focus my attention, my attention entirely on the past, that is, on Jesus' death and resurrection. There was so much in the Bible that excited me. All those Old Testament stories, I loved the, the ripping yarns of the Old Testament, people being, uh, getting lots of frogs and plagues and things like that and I love the story of Jesus' miracles and Jesus' teaching and Jesus' death and his mighty resurrection and ascension and the coming of the Spirit. I decided it would be enough for me to live as a Christian to focus on the past, to look back to the glories, the sufferings and glories of Christ in the past. 
And then I found myself preaching on 1 Peter, as happens occasionally. And I got to verse 13 of chapter 1, where I was instructed by God, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I thought, I don't need that. I don't need eternal reward. I don't need the threat of eternal punishment. If I just think about the past, about the coming, the first coming of the Lord Jesus, that'll be enough. Silly me. How ridiculous to set aside what God has promised to give me. To think I don't need a living hope in the return of Jesus Christ. Please don't be as foolish as I was. Learn with me to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I have learnt over the years that without that living hope, without that future hope, I easily become despondent and easily give up. You've been born again to a living hope. It makes sense, verse 3. So therefore set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I have two dogs, Beatrice, who's a spoodle, that's a spaniel and poodle, uh, and Bertie, who's a Chihuahua Maltese cross. They're both uh, mixed dogs. They're both, you know, crossbreeds. So they're a bit confused sometimes about who they are. But anyway, they're happy little dogs. And let me tell you, they live their life with a living hope. They spend their whole day hoping hoping for food, always ear cocked, ready to hear the fridge opened or the, the cupboard opened, always hoping for a walk. The moment the lead is brought out, they're there. They do hope rather better than I do, as a matter of fact. They live all day in hope and they wake up in hope of breakfast. What a wonderful way to live, full of hope. Just how we should be living on more substantial things than hoping for breakfast and walks, though they are enjoyable, I must admit. That is, our breakfasts are enjoyable and their breakfasts are enjoyable in a different kind of way. God provided a living hope because you need it. We're created for a living hope. We're saved for a living hope. We need a living hope. God has given us a living hope. This, of course, is so countercultural, isn't it? The world around us dismisses us as those who are looking for a pie in the sky when you die. The world around us says, well, of course, you, you Christians, you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly use at all. If only they'd open their eyes, they'd see that the only pe people who are of earthly use are those who are heavenly minded. But we are too often, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, like little children who've been promised a day at the beach choosing instead to stay at home and make mud pies. What do you need? You need living hope. As persecuted Christians today need living hope, don't they? If you're just think of the man or woman today who is facing, facing death because they're a believer. What would you say to them? Well, don't worry. You're not going to live for long. What would you say? Would you say, well, you can at least hope your death will be painless? No, you'd say, you have a living hope, an inheritance, imperishable undefiled and unfading. You have a future with God at, uh, and, and you'll see him at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You'll say the Lord Jesus is coming today to take you to his heavenly Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. But today you will be taken by Jesus Christ to your heavenly Father. That's a living hope, isn't it? They have no other hope, but they have that living hope. Adoniram Judson, who was a pioneer mission, missionary to Burma, now, now called Myanmar, of course, was uh, one, day threat, one, one day threatened uh, by uh, his uh, people who captured him with death, and they mocked him. They said, well, you know, what does your future look like now? I love his reply. The future is as bright as the promises of God. What a great way to die. Could you say with him, my future is as bright as the promises of God. Not a gloomy future, but a bright future. Bright with God's promises. Bright because it is a living hope, not a dead dream. And Peter tells us what it's like to undergo trials of various kinds when we have a living hope. He says, look at verse 6, well, uh, in this you rejoice, though thou for a little while, you, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So there's grief when we undergo trials or temptations. But then he says in verse 7 that this is so, that, that uh, the, the tested genuineness of your faith, that is, God sends us trials and temptations to test the genuineness of our faith. That is, to prove the genuineness of our faith. To show that it is genuine faith. Often when trials come, we think, what have I done wrong? What mistake did I make? Why is God punishing me? We should be thinking, no, God has sent this trial that he might prove the endurance, the stability, the strength of my faith. That's the wonderful thing in the book of Job in the Old Testament, isn't it? You read through the book and you see Job undergoing all these dreadful trials. But when you read the first chapters, you know what's going on. Because, Job, because God boasts about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? And the trials are to prove to Satan that Job will be a man of faith and faithfulness. Though you might wonder on the way through the book if Job is still trusting God, one thing you can be certain, God is trusting Job. Job may complain, he does for about 30, 40 chapters, he complains. But despite his pain and despite his complaints, God is trusting him. And God's trust is vindicated. Job's faith is proved to be genuine and indeed Job's faith is strengthened by his trials well I could ask you a question I could say just think back over your life when have you grown most as a believer would you say in easy times or in difficult times? I'd certainly say in trials and temptations and disappointments and times of great grief. And if you've got an hour or two after the service, I could tell you all about it. I'm never particularly cheerful at the time, despite James's instruction, count it all joy when you meet various trials. No, I can never manage it at the time. But 20 years later, I look back and think, that was a good time. That was a kind gift of God. And how much that's helped me to help others who are going through trials and temptations, you see. Imagine you've gone to your GP and you said, look, I'm really troubled by lots of trials in my life. And your GP is sympathetic and kind. 
with her or his time. And she says, well, I, I've, I've, I've diagnosed the problem, dear. What you need is more what? What you need is more... Le Can you imagine what, what I was going to say? You need more living hope. That's what you need. And how wonderful that God has provided living hope through his mercy and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I read on the newspaper in Australia uh, last year, I think it was, that a woman in Queensland had taken part in a marathon, the kind of thing I often do before breakfast uh, myself. Anyway, she was feeling a bit sort of feverish or something, not so strong, so she thought she'd run a half marathon rather than a full marathon. A bit wimpish, I think, but anyway. So she, went, uh, she ran a half marathon, and then there was an exit point where you left the half marathon because you weren't going to run a full marathon, but she took the wrong turning by mistake and ran the whole marathon and won it by mistake. Isn't that good? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have done that, won a marathon by mistake? Oh, I've run a marathon. When I look at Christians in Australia, I think most Christians are actually ro running the wrong marathon. Most Christians in Australia run a happiness marathon rather than a holiness marathon. To run a happiness marathon is to think all the time, am I happy? You having a good year? Yes. No troubles. How's your year going? Really well. No difficulties. I'm happy. I'm really happy. How's your life? Really good. No dark clouds on the horizon. All going really well. How's your year going? I'm running a holiness marathon. By God's kindness, I thank him for my trials. Because he is proving and improving the genuineness of my faith. See, the happiness, the happiness marathon says, God loves me, he's taken away all my trials. The person on the holiness marathon says, God loves me in the midst of the trials. He has sent me and through which he sustains me. You see, if you ask God to increase your love for fellow believers, God will send a really unpleasant fellow believer into your life so your love can increase. Don't look around the room at the person you're thinking of, please. <laughs> and if, if you ask God to strengthen your faith, how will he do that? By sending just the right trial to prove the genuineness of your faith. Well, the mathematics is very simple. Here it is. The more hope you have, more living hope, the less grief you have in your trials, the more praise you have and the more joy you have. More hope, less grief, more praise, more joy. Here's the other formula. Less hope, more grief, less praise, less joy. Well, we all meet various trials, various temptations, various tests, don't we, in our own private lives? We're often tried and tested and tempted as Christians. We may be tried or tempted or tested in our work situation. We may feel, uh, as I certainly do, that in a decaying and disintegrating society we face great trials and temptations and tests. You may be, your marriage may be undergoing a time of trial or testing or temptation. Your church may feel that it's undergoing trials and temptations 
and test, you may think, what did we do wrong? But what God is doing is strengthening your faith. And faith, Peter tells us, is even more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire. And Peter says that when our faith is tested, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peter says that though, though we haven't seen him, we still love him. And we believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Is that the life you want? Then keep alive your living Well, I wonder what area of your life you would change this week if you decided to live this week full of the living hope into which you've been born again. I wonder what area of your life would change if you decided to live in the light of your living hope this week. How would it change your prayers? How would it change your priorities? How would a living hope change your fears? Your life? Your ministry? Your attitude? You've no idea the answer to that question. <laughs> My advice is read 1 Peter because it'll tell you exactly what areas of life you need to change if your life is full of living hope. And please notice too that Peter reminds us in uh, verses 10 and 11, 10 and 11, that in living this way we are just following in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he talks about the Old Testament prophets predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So you think, it's not right that I'm going through suffering and trials. Remember, Jesus did. We follow in his steps. We follow in his sufferings that we might follow in his glories. What has God provided? Living hope. What do you need? Living hope. What has God given you? Living hope. Come on, you can do it, dear friends. How might you live? With living hope. How do you want to die? With living hope, don't you? Well, you better start practicing now. It's a bit late to think on the day of your death, oh, I think I need living hope. Practice now, my advice, and you'll die well. Well, George Whitfield was a great evangelist in, here in Scotland and in England and North America, and he went to be a student at uh, Pembroke College, Oxford, as a 17-year-old recently converted to Christ. Here is his account of his first trials as a believer. Forgive the slightly dated language. But when religion began to take root in my heart, and I was fully convinced my soul must totally be renewed, I was visited with outward and inward trials. I incurred the displeasure of the master of the college who threatened to expel me. My relations counted my life madness. I daily underwent some contempt at college. Some have thrown dirt at me. Two friends forsook me. Then in his journal he writes this about these trials. These, though little, were useful trials. They inured me to contempt, lessened self-love, and taught me to die daily. Isn't that remarkable? I don't often hear Christians today talking about useful trials. Here's another one which I find equally challenging. John Fletcher was a friend of John Wesley 
And uh, one occasion when he was ill, he was visited by a friend who said, as, the, as you do, I'm sorry to find you so ill. Fletcher replied, sorry, sir, why should you be sorry? It's the chastisement of my heavenly father and I rejoice in it. I love the rod of my God, rejoice therein as an expression of his love and affection towards me. Well, I'd never managed that. When I get a cold, I don't say, well, thank you, God, for a cold. I think, oh, how awful. Poor me, because I, I get worse colds than anybody else, you know. They're, they're really serious. Other people get a cold, I think, oh, stop complaining. When I have one, it's nearly the end of the world. It's a man cold. See, really serious matter. Sorry, you're ill? Why should you be sorry? Well, here's most challenging of all. Here's a prayer request from the persecuted church in the Middle East. Please don't pray for us. If you pray for us, you'll pray the wrong things. You'll pray for our safety. You mean you don't want us to pray for your safety? I mean, surely you'd pray for the safety of persecuted Christians. Please pray with us. Listen to this. If you pray with us, you'll ask God to bring millions to faith in Christ. You'll pray that when the inevitable backlash comes because of our witness, we'll be faithful even if it costs us our lives. Isn't that remarkable? If I were a persecuted Christian, I'd be sending out emails every day. Please pray that I'd be rescued then I might remember that actually Paul never prayed or asked for prayers that he'd be let out of prison, but that he'd be faithful to Christ in prison. And how I'm challenged and warmed by these words from our contemporary brothers and sisters in Christ facing persecution today. Pray with us. Ask God to bring millions to faith in Christ. And pray that when the inevitable backlash comes because of our witness, we'll be faithful, even if it costs us our lives. Well, friends, what a massive challenge. And what a great possibility. What an open door God has set before us. When in his mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We stand to pray together. Together we pray. Blessed are you, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to your great mercy, you have caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us as we have been guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We rejoice in this though now for a little while we are grieved by various trials, so that the test of genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though we have not seen him, we love him. Though we do not now see him, we believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Help us to set our hope fully on the grace that will be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed. In his name we pray.
Well, if you take up your hymn books, we're going to sing to close hymn number 236. This hymn by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who knew all about focusing on the hope that is before us. By gracious power, so wonderfully sheltered and confidently waiting, come what may, we know that God is with us night and morning and never fails to meet us each new day. Number 236. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>